David Thomas with Orchard Hills Church here in Noonan. My father, Dr. Stacy Thomas, he's going to be delivering the sermon today. Last week we talked about Job. Job had a lot of questions for God when he was going through those trials. Why was he being picked on? Well, God manifested himself to Job and answered those questions. We see a lot of correlation to that in 1 Peter. Peter had a lot of questions after Christ went to the cross. You know, when he was on the shore, after he had gone out fishing and they didn't catch anything, God manifested himself to Peter and he answered those questions. Peter went on to be the rock of the church. He's going to dive into that today. Stay tuned. You're going to get a lot of value out of it. We have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. His name is Jesus. We're thankful for his sacrifice and his great friendship to us. That we can pour everything out to him in prayer. That was awesome. You know, act like y'all been singing for a while. That was good. Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 21. You know, I got finished with Job and I went straight into 1 Peter and uh, started to prepare for a future Bible study on that. And I just started seeing so many similarities with Peter and with Job. Uh, that I had to back up and ask myself a question, how did Job get there? And so I want to ask you a couple of questions. Have you ever been so confused about your, where you are in life, why Jesus doesn't show up and make everything clear? And you feel like you can't wait any longer, you become restless, you think you'll go crazy if you don't just do something, you must do something, and then you finally do something, it doesn't turn out to produce what you want, and you're really in a worse position than you were before. 
but you still don't know what to do. You make a knee-jerk reaction because you're so restless, and your situation turns out to be even worse. Well, that's exactly where Mr. Peter was in chapter 21. They knew Jesus was alive. He'd already made himself known after 40 days of proofs, but yet they were confused. What's happened? What's changed? What are we supposed to do? Uh, what is our role now? How do we fit into all of this? And this is where we are in chapter 21 of John. You know, it's amazing that the um, commentators seem to all just agree on one point about this. And I never knew this until I studied it this past week. I should have known. I guess I just looked over it or forgotten it. Chapter 21, John added later. All of the rest was finished before. Because you can look at verse 31. He gives the conclusion of chapter 20. But these things were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name, period. That's it. But you know, he was so close to Peter. And seeing Peter over the years do what he did... He remembered back to a day on a beach there at the Lake of Galilee, and he recalled how this transition took place. And he wanted to give that to Peter, probably after Peter had already been crucified. He wanted to give his just desserts to this man who'd probably been his best friend. You know, John was the dreamer. Peter was the doer. Peter was the problem solver. Tom was the, ref the uh, he was, re John was the reflective one. And so let's read these verses, and then we're going to draw some conclusions about it. Chapter 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again. And then you look over to verse 14, he says, this is the third time. Does, it means it's the third time he's made a specific individual appearance to these guys, particularly Peter. And so he says, he showed himself again. And we'll talk about that word, showed himself again here in just a minute. He showed himself again, to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, that's Galilee. And in this way, he showed himself. Obviously, that's important. In the Greek means manifestation with intention. Verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of the disciples were together. Two unnamed, so it makes seven of them. I don't know where the others were. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. I'm going fishing. I can't take any more of this. I can't take any more of this waiting. I can't take any more of this uncertainty. I need clarity. I need to know where we are, and I am just going crazy right now. I just can't sit any longer. I've got to do something. Well, that's not what God had told him to do. You read back in the other Gospels, he told his disciples to go to Galilee and wait on the mount for him. He told them to go pray and wait. Well, Peter's in Galilee, but the praying and waiting just got to be too much. Has that ever happened to you? Praying and waiting just got to be too much? And so you took it into your own hands and you decided, you know what, we've got to do something to distract ourselves from this insanity, he thought. And he left the post of his obedience and trust where he was supposed to be sailing under sealed orders, but he decided, I've got to open these things in some way and do it myself. You know, I remember uh, my mother may be able to remember this. One time, uh, day camp, we went to day camp as little kids at College Park back in the day, in the summer. And we were supposed to wait there until our mother picked us up. But one day... I don't know what happened to her. She forgot about us. She was shopping or she got involved in something. Anyway, 
We waited a long time, about an hour. And I don't know if it's Stan or one of us, but we finally said, you know what? Let's just walk on. Well, walking home was about, I don't know, three miles, something like that. But we decided to do it. You know, we just followed in and started walking home. And she found us along the way. And she couldn't stop hugging us. But once we got in the car, you know what she told us? She said, as soon as I get y'all home, I'm going to whip you good. You should have waited. You have scared me to death. I've been all over looking for you, thinking, you know, something's happened to you. You're gone. And you can only imagine a mother's concern there. Well, these guys said, I am going fishing. Well, think about that for just a minute. Jesus called them the first time from a fishing boat. He said, you're going to leave catching fish and you're going to catch men. Well, they weren't catching men now. They were going back to catching fish. They were going back to something God had not called them to do. But they were saying, I need clarity instead of confusion. I need some peace instead of this unsettled heart that I've got. I need joy instead of this sadness. I need something different. I need the familiar. I know that lake. I was born there at that lake. I've been out on that boat a billion times. I know every fishing hole here. I just need to smell that air of water and those fish. I need to be there in the familiar. But you know what? There's something wrong with that. Did you know the greatest joys that you'll ever experience are with the unfamiliar you know that song, Jesus called it, I forget how it goes, uh, the, the man and the son sing it. Uh, and he, it's about, uh, he's called us to walk out on the waters. He's called you to the unfamiliar. And if you want to stay with the familiar, you're never going to be what God wants you to be. He wants you to go further and longer and bigger and higher than you've been before. But we want to stay where we feel comfortable. Well, God didn't call you to be comfortable. He doesn't, he's not into the non rockabotus He loves the storms because they challenge your faith. That's what Job is all about. This is what's happening at this particular moment. They're failing this lesson. But I want you to see what happens. He said, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we're going with you. They immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Imagine. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, notice how tender those words are. He just didn't say, you rebellious bunch of renegades. You kids that didn't listen, he says, children, a very affectionate term. Have you any food? They answered him, no. <laughs> All night fishing, not catching one. Well, I have experienced that. And he said to them, cast the net on the other side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast. And they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of fish. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord, obviously John the Baptist. I mean, John the Beloved. He said, It is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you've caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. Although there were so many, yet the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. 
So when he had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, his original name, significance in that, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs, my sheep, and he used the, the younger word, lambs. And he said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him again, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said unto them, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God, and when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, <clears throat> who is the one that betrays you? I mean, that was old news there. That had already happened. He was really confused. Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Talking about John, the disciple. Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die, yet Jesus did not say that he would not die, but if, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This is a disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that, this, that his testimony is true. And there were also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Now, I want to give you 12 lessons out of this that after studying this a good bit, that I think this sums it up. One, even in disobedience and confusion, God entered into the immediate needs of his people and made himself known. <clears throat> you know, you, you think you've got problems. You've got money problems. You've got health problems. You've got family problems, children problems, work problems. I mean, you could go on with problems forever and ever. But, he's, but God even in their disobedience to previous instruction, as if to ignore that. He never rebuked Peter for fishing. It's amazing. He could have said to him, boy, what are you doing? He never did it. Rather, he zoned in on the immediate need of loneliness and confusion and the need of fellowship and the need of assurance and his need of hunger at that particular moment. And he came right into his life. I love it. He entered in where they were. They were looking for fish. Jesus had fish. He had them on the shore besides theirs. But... Their disobedience and confusion didn't stop him from meeting their needs. That really says a lot to me. I can mess up, but God's still interested in my mortgage. I can mess up, but God is still interested in where I am in life. He does not abandon me. The Bible says, if we're unfaithful, he is still faithful. He cannot deny himself. He's on the job whether you are or not. That ought to bring you something. That ought to bring in within you a sense of gratitude and affection and love to the one that so zeroes in on where you are. He has not ignored your immediate need, but he's using this need for a greater purpose. Exactly like Job. Don't you see? That's why 
I don't want you to turn, I just want you to listen to it. When he wrote, you see, First Peter is a different man. How'd you get that way? I know you got filled by the Holy Spirit. But what was the, the, really the confrontation that changed your life? And it's in chapter 21. Because when you listen to uh, verse 5 of chapter 1, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Parismos in the Greek is the word from which we get pirate. Unwelcomed, unsought for, unexpected intruder into your life. He said, that's what you're going to have. You're going to have this pirate that comes into your life. He said, there's a purpose in that, though. That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you know what his whole book is about? Submission and trust in the midst of suffering. It's about trusting when you don't know why you're trusting. Or how to trust. It's keeping on when you have no more power to keep on. It's God's power that's keeping you on. It's rewarding you here and now for your submission and obedience when you don't understand why. Just like Job. He got there. And when I read First Peter and Second Peter, and I, it, it just so thrilled me coming out of Job that I look for the answer as to where and how this happened. And it's right here in chapter 21 of John. So, that's number one. Number two, God always initiates the calling, not us. He said, children, have you any, have you any food? He's the one that initiated the conversation. People say, well, I found God. No, you didn't find God. God found you. You say, well, I'm seeking God. You're seeking God because he's already sought you. The grace of God is what pulls you towards God. We don't take credit for one single thing. It's God who does it all. We are rebellious, reprobates. We don't, we won't, in our own selves, we want nothing to do with God. We're born rebellious. We live rebellious. We were controlled by the flesh. And were it not for the grace of God, you would never give him one iota of attention. It's all God. He said, children, have you any food? <laughs> I love it that he didn't say fish. Fish was obvious. But he went deeper than fish. You need food. You need sustenance. It's a loaded question. You need answers for where you are in life that go beyond filling your belly. God's the one that's calling you. If you're feeling an unsettledness today and an uneasiness today about needs in your life that are not being met, I guarantee you God's using them and he's the, one, he's the one that's doing the calling. And he's calling for a purpose. There's one simple answer. Did, it, did we find what we were looking for apart from Christ? No. <laughs> I remember after graduating from uh, high school and a lot of kids went over to Europe to find themselves. They would backpack for one year, two years, whatever, and live in those, uh, what do they call them, hostels and uh, all that kind of stuff. Did that promote them in life to where they found themselves? They discovered, Eureka, I know who I am now? No. <laughs> they came back just as messed up as they were when they left. Because seeking to know yourself apart from God is a journey in futility. You don't know the answers. God does. And so we will not find what we're looking for apart from God. Check out history and it will attest to what I'm saying. <laughs> I've read those stories of the greatest atheist philosophers that there were. And I mean greatest by the most well-known. Sartre, all of those guys. At the end, they end up. Totally disgusted, uncertain, bitter, angry with life. They didn't find the answers. 
They were looking in the wrong place. You see, the answers are only in Jesus Christ. And in the midst of your trouble, God shows up. He comes walking on the waters of adversity, just like he did with Peter when he started drowning and he called him to himself. That's how he discloses himself. That's how he manifests himself. God uses problems and physical needs to demonstrate spiritual lessons. I love this. This is deja vu. You know why? The first miracle that Jesus ever did was in Galilee. He turned water into wine. The last miracle that God ever did is right here at the, at the sea. Galilee, Galilee. No wine, no fish. <laughs> That's the problem. But what did he tell him to do in the first time? He said, go fill up all the water parts, all, all the pots with all the wine pots that were empty with water. That didn't make a bit of sense. Then he tells them to fish on the right side of the boat as if probably they've been fishing on the other side because that's where the hole is, but they've been fishing all night. You don't catch fish during the day. They've already done this one time before. It's a total irrational, unreasonable request that Jesus made, but that does not matter. You see, when God calls you to do something, it doesn't have to make sense to you, just like my dad. He used to say, I used to say, well, uh, you know, uh, okay, he'd say, do this, do this, do this. And I'd say, why? He'd say, for you to do it, it's not necessary for you to understand why. All you got to do is do it. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. What happened after it was over, after they did, obeyed him, the best wine they'd ever had right there on the spot. More fish than they could draw in in that net. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. You see, eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. God always gives more than you expect when you obey him and do it his way. That's truth. You can go through testimony after testimony in history. When you do it God's way and you get God involved, you'll always get a return on your investment. Number five. You know, I got to look at this and he said, bring me some of the fish which you've caught. And I thought, God didn't need that. And there's a lesson here. God can do it without you, but he chooses to use you. He can evangelize without you. He can do it another way. But he chose man. He chose his children to be his tools in order for us to be a part of his great campaign. He had a donkey speak one time. He could have a donkey preaching if he wanted to instead of me up here. Sometimes there may be a similarity. But he uses us. What a privilege to be used by God in any capacity. He could do it himself. The stones cry out. He could do it another way. Number six, obedience and hope always gives great energy and drive. Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of large fish. Before, they could not eat, all, all the rest of them, after Peter jumped out of the boat, they couldn't even drag it into the boat. They couldn't even get it in the boat. Peter grabs those, and I did the math on that, uh, Papa, Mr. Hoyt. If they caught 153 fish, and they said large fish, let's just be conservative and say that was five pounds apiece. That's 765 pounds. If they'd been 10 pounds apiece, that'd been 1,500 pounds. He went out there and grabbed that entire net and broke it and brought it in and it didn't break the net. Before, he was downcast, looking for a diversion, restless, and now he's full of energy and excitement and zeal for God. That's what it is when you get out of the boat and you swim to Jesus. You get to the source 
of what you're looking for. And that's exactly what he did. You notice Jesus said, come in verse 12, eat breakfast. And then you know what he, he gave it to them, likewise the fish. You know what that means? He went around after cooking that fish and he put a piece on each one of their plates and served them. God takes more delight in meeting your needs than you do in having it met. If you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will your heavenly father give unto them to ask him? He wants to give you the desires of your heart more than you want to receive it. You know what the devil's greatest lie is? God will never give you what you're looking for and what you're longing for. He wants you miserable eating briars for the rest of your life. That's the way Christians are, you know. They're just miserable people. That's a lie. Christians should be the most excited, happy, delighted people on the face of this earth because he delights in meeting our needs, even our immediate needs. That's the truth. Next. He said, my sheep, my lambs. You know, in John 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the door to the sheep. I am those great ego I me sayings. I and I alone am the good shepherd. What do shepherds do? They lead their sheep. They take care of their sheep. They feed their sheep. They, they, they get all the bugs off of them, the insects, the parasites. They tend to their sheep. He's a shepherd, but you know what he's doing? He's trying to give a lesson to these boys, particularly Peter. I'm also calling you to be a shepherd. I'm calling you to be an under-shepherd of some kind of flock. And so I don't want you to miss the lesson here, Peter, that you are going. You see, <laughs> Jesus could have really gotten to him. He could have, you see, because if you read through, Peter was the pillar of the early church. Paul came later. Peter put that thing together in Jerusalem. He could have looked down through the decades, God, and seen all of his sheep. Decades, centuries, millennia of those who he had elected to come to him. And he'd said, Peter, don't you know what you stand to mess up here? Out in a boat fishing when you should have been up on a mountain praying? He never said that. All he did is give a manifestation of himself as what? Feeding them. Caring for them. Coming to them. Not rebuking them. But coming to them in unconditional love. You see, <laughs> Peter had immediate needs. God knows you've got immediate needs. You've got a house payment. You've got other things. You've got insurance. You've got children. You've got all that stuff you've got to do. But there was something so much bigger here. I am giving you, not only am I going to meet your immediate need, but I'm going to expand that to you being a shepherd over so much more. I want you to be a steward of a bigger house here, Peter. I want you to have a greater reward in heaven. And then he gets to my favorite part in verse 15. He gives Peter the requirements for discipleship and shepherding. Oh, this is good. Do you love me, Peter? You know what the first requirement is? That you love him. Ephesus, you left your first love. There's no church of Ephesus in Turkey today. It's gone. You left your first love. What is the first commandment? Love the Lord thy God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. But the first thing is to love him. Let me ask you something. Do you really love him? 
Is he the one you think about when you get up in the mornings? Do you love him? There's got to be a relationship. There's got to be time for you to develop that supreme love. But you know what? Oh, Peter, that's one thing you couldn't say he didn't do. He loved his Lord. Yeah, he blew it. And you may blow it. Even though you love God, you may still blow it. The flesh is a powerful enemy. And he talks about that in 1 Peter. It may cause you in some way to be overcome and to be disobey God. But there may be a contradictory love for God in the midst of all of this. And what is he doing? He's trying to show you how to develop and expand and to allow God. You know, there's such a love affair going on between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that you can't even imagine. And now that you're in Christ, you're also in the Father and the Holy Spirit's inside of you. And when you ask him, God, would you just allow me to be party to this love affair? Would you allow me to feel what you feel in your love towards your Father and I can adopt that myself? That's a great request. Do you love me, Peter? You really love me? You've been with me for three years. You've watched me heal the sick. You've watched me raise the dead. You've wa watched me walk on water. You've seen me be hungry. You've seen me go into the temple angry and clear it out. Do you love me, Peter? You see, isn't it amazing? He never brought up the fact that he denied Jesus three times. I don't know the man. I never knew the man. And he cursed the third time. Wow. But he couldn't forget those eyes of Jesus when he turned and looked at him. And Peter remembered and went out and wept bitterly. Why? Because he loved him. He had failed him, but he loved him. I will never... I will never betray you, though the whole tribe betrays you and deserts you. I will die for you. Really? Really? That's all flesh talking there, Peter. That's the first requirement. Love, supreme devotion. Secondly, humility. Humility. I love this because... He says to Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me in the Greek? Agape is the strongest love there is. It's unconditional, unlimited. Has nothing to do with whether you love somebody back. It's like the guy, this true story, was in military prison all those years, and finally they exonerated him. It was, wasn't him that did it, and he came out. Don't you hate the army for spending these 18 years in jail? Nope. I love the army. Still love it. You see, me being in prison didn't change that love. My love for the army was unconditional. I thought, wow, what an example of agape. Unconditional love. He said, do you unconditionally love me, Peter? And I love this. He said, yes, Lord, you know that I filio you. That means strong affection, like a brother has to a brother, but it doesn't mean agape. Before he would have said agape, I guarantee you he'd have said agape all day long. But now since he's been humbled, he does not dare use that word. His humility is coming out. Usually we're talking about the proud Peter here. He says, you know that I filio you. Tend my sheep. He said to him the second time, the, second, the same thing. He said the same thing over again. Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. And then the third time, what does he say to him? Simon, son of Jonah. And then Jesus condescends to even his terminology. And Jesus says, do you even filio me? Wow. That must have pierced his heart straight through. 
Do you even have a strong affection for me, Peter? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You're omniscient. If anybody in the world knows that I love you, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. You see, God wants us to do the job he's called us to do. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and finish his work. If you're breathing, you haven't finished the work God's called you to do. He was a testimony to the truth of God. We're all testimonies to that truth. And you see, do you love me? You know all things. Feed my sheep. You're giving away out of your tender humility here and your broken spirit. God never uses somebody. He never totally blesses them until he breaks them. Peter was broken. He was broken there when he denied him. He's broken here. Broken bread then is shared. Not before it's broken. Now you're a candidate to feed my sheep. You've been broken yourself. Now you can spread out the bread and the fish that I've just handed out to you. Because you know we're not talking about physical fish. We're talking about something greater. We're talking about the gospel, Peter. You know that. You're called the rock. We're talking about the gospel. We're talking about keys. We're talking about opening doors of eternity and shutting doors of eternity. And you've got the privilege of sharing the gospel of that great news and being a leader in that regard for me. Peter was getting it. And he says, and he says to him, verse 18, Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, I girt, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. It's uncontended that Peter was crucified. The part that we don't know for sure was his wife crucified on a cross, a cross from him. It seems to be good evidence of that. But Peter, not willing to be crucified like Jesus, was crucified upside down. And he tells him here, Peter, you've got the same destiny I had, the cross. Now, it's one thing to have to face it when it happens the next day or you're, you're condemned and you've got three days to think about it or whatever, but he's got years to know it, just like Jesus did. You really want to be like Jesus? There's a price for that. What was the third thing he called him to? The third requirement, courage. Devotion, humility, courage. Are you willing, Peter? And he knew he was or he would have said it to him. The courage that you've talked about all this time is now going to be yours. You're going to own it for the rest of your life. You're going to know that you're a walking dead man. You're going to be freed from the fear of death because you know one day it's coming. Therefore, you'll never fear it. You know, I was reading about uh, Navy SEALs and just what they do. And the ones in Afghanistan, I read a father's report about a son. And his son was given testimony to the fact that uh, a mine had gone off and he had all kind of shrapnel and everything, but he said that's not the big deal. He said the big deal is a guy named Mansoor. We called Mickey. Mickey, when a, when a, when a, land, when a uh, grenade was thrown right into our platoon in split-second timing, not a thought, he jumped on it himself. Blew himself up, killed him. He saved everybody in the platoon. He said, I'm naming, my, I'm naming my son Mickey. It's 
what he did. He said, I'll never forget him. Now, Jesus threw himself on your cross. Your sins he took for you. He didn't have to do it. He didn't owe any penalties and gave his life. And he basically was saying to Peter, the cross I took, you can't take. But you're going to take another one. It spells death. Death to yourself in a thousand different ways. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. The terms of discipleship. It's all through the Bible. Peter, you've had a hard time doing that. You, like James and John, have wanted to be the select three. You wanted to be the greatest. You wanted to know your place in the kingdom. That's what you wanted. But now you know your path is one of death just like mine. Wow. Then he said to him, he says, this he spoke, signifying by what death he should glorify God in verse 19. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. You know, there's guys in the service, they go out and they find landmines. They have sophisticated equipment, but not only that, they are experts in poking and prodding until they hit that metal clink. And there's only one way to get through some of those places in Afghanistan. You've got to stay right behind your guy. You can't walk to the right or you can't walk to the left. Or you'll be in some very dangerous territory. Peter, in 1 Peter, you know what he said? 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. You are never in free land. There's always landmines. Unless you're following God, you're going to step into them. You're going to be blown up. There's going to be damage. There's going to be loss of time. There may be a loss of potential. Follow me, Peter, and you will get where you're going. Ah, abundant blessing always follows obedience. Peter succeeded, as his life tells us. The very last lesson is this. Peter says, what about him? What about him? You know, I just did a funeral, the one I told you about for Bobby. Did that on Thursday. It was a... Uh, they had 60 in their lineage. Could you believe that? Their children, they only had three children. But they had a great, great, two great, great grandchildren. 60 of the family were there. Of their immediate family descendants. And I heard different people talking about, you know, this and that. All came down to one thing. I wonder how I'm going to go. I wonder how he's going to go. I wonder how mom's going to go. <laughs> he said to Jesus, what about him? What about this man? In the Greek, it's really <laughs> kind of funny. This man, what about it? What about John? He's the dreamer. I'm the action man. We've been partners all the way through. What about him? Are we going to be together in this? I need him. Well, he had a different plan for John. John's going a totally different way. He didn't go with Peter. He went to different places. He ended up living, the only one living out of all the others martyred, 96 years old, carrying rocks on the Isle of Patmos until one day he gets this revelation from heaven right there out of Revelation, I think it's uh, 4. And he says to him, look up here, old man, and I'll show you things to come. And he writes the greatest revelation of future things that's ever been known to any man in civilization. That's what I've got for John. I've got a living martyrdom for you. You're going to die under Nero. 
12. He was basically saying to Peter, you don't have to give an account to other people. And you don't have to give an account of what they do or how I take them. I tell you where to fish on the right side of the boat, and I'll tell you where you're going to die, and it's my business. I don't need you to micromanage me where they die. I've got it under control, Peter. Your death and his death, both will be for my glory. I just need you to follow me. Follow me? Huh. Arthur, bless it. Follow me me. How difficult is that? Not so much. He gives us the grace to follow him. I'll close with this. In 1 Peter, I figured out what his formula is. And this is what it is. Sufferings produce more grace. Grace produces hope. Hope produces peace. Peace produces holy living and obedience. That produces joy. Joy produces strength. Strength produces unselfish love. You recharge your battery with the Word of God. It provides growth, new trials, new grace, and future glory. <laughs> that is a man that had learned. Boy, had he ever learned. Peter. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you. Father, I pray this morning for somebody who's sitting out here saying, you know what? I've been restless. Boy, have I ever been restless. I don't know when God's going to show up. I don't have clarity. I don't have peace. I don't have joy. I don't have love. I don't have any of those things. My life is so topsy-turvy that I would do anything to have peace of mind. Fishing, I don't care what it is. But yet I've tried them all. And nothing brings me satisfaction. Father, would you speak to that person and show them that only Jesus Christ can bring them the satisfaction they're longing for. He only can meet their needs. He only can take care of what is going on in their lives. And there's something even greater than that than their immediate needs. There's something far greater that he wants to bless them with and use them with and show them and give them to him that will last for all of eternity, God. Let us listen to your manifestation of yourself. As you show yourself to us, let us hear you. And then, Father, somebody who does not know you as Lord and Savior, and you're seeking them. They think they're seeking you, but you're seeking them. You're calling to them. You're telling them that you have what they need right there on the shore of eternity, what they've been looking for. Out of your love and out of your mercy and out of your cross, you provide atonement for their sins. Father, let them speak to you now and say, Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on Calvary for my sins. I confess them to you right now. I repent of them, I turn away from them, and I turn to you by faith alone. Take me, God. Save me. I throw myself on you. Take me to heaven when I die. And I'll give you all the glory, all the honor. Thank you for saving me. We as believers, God, in the midst of this world trial situation, we, like Peter, may not get out of it alive. We may be martyred, or we may not. That's your business. But Father, may we carry on today and learn and listen and have the grace to do what you said. Follow you. Show each and every one of us what following you really means. To follow you. To step where you step. To go where you go. To speak when you tell us to speak. To know what to say. And to live in love with you, God. To bask in that love that you have for us and to love you in return. The greatest privilege in life is to be able to love Almighty God. Let us do that. And then, God, 
Would that cause incredible humility in us like Peter? And then, Father, courage. Courage to take up our cross, whatever that might be, and follow you wherever you want me, God. I don't care what it means. I don't care where it lands me. There's only one thing that I long to hear, well done. I've got to finish what you call me to do. The rest is your business. Give me the grace, God, to do it. All glory and honor to you. And Father, we'll thank you and praise you for that. Oh, how we love you this morning. Bless those that have heard it. And may they be strengthened by it. In Jesus' name and for your sake, we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please?